Uh, so my intention for tonight is to finish up chapter nine licensing. Um, I only have about maybe like three or four more sections left to cover in that. Once we do that, we'll jump over to object documentation, and then we'll start talking about some of the ins and outs that go into that. Uh, a couple of reminders uh, as we start this session for this evening, and let me share my screen so we have these up. Most people know about these, so I'm not going to dig too deep into them. Um, can everybody see my, my uh, book down slides? Okay, great. Uh, so the first thing is, is, you know, obviously if we need to slow down and discuss, let me know. This group has been pretty good about it. But again, just as a reminder, if there's any questions or if I get something wrong, just let me know. Uh, the other thing is just make sure you understand that the sessions are recorded. They go up on YouTube. I think most people understand that. And um, if you're interested in checking out the schedule, it's available in the Slack channel. Um, I think we already have somebody for next week. I think it's actually Ryan who has signed up for vignettes. But there are some other um, sections and chapters later on that definitely need a, um, a speaker to take on those responsibilities. So if you're interested, check those out. And then just the last thing is I'm just going to give a quick reminder because we're still going to be talking about some of those legal things regarding licensing. Um, this is mainly uh, for people who are watching this later. Uh, if you watch this, just understand that the information that I'm sharing with you is not to be considered legal advice. I am not a lawyer. So um, if you have questions about this, seek out a consultant uh, or from, from the legal profession. So um, just mainly a reminder for people who are watching this later that I am not a lawyer. Uh, this is not legal advice. So seek out a legal professional if you need uh, have any questions. So we finished up last time talking about relicensing. Um, we shared a couple of examples about how this relicensing process goes. I shared these three examples coming from generics, uh, from Kovar, and then um, interest in this interesting issue in ggplot that kind of walked through kind of that relicensing process and how we discussed how all the contributors need to agree to the licensing change before the licensing change actually can take place. And so we kind of shared those examples. Where we were, where we kind of ended up was where we were, where we ended up were talking about um, different packages or licensing of different packages and licensing regarding uh, different types of code that you use, whether that's code given to you from other people or that's code that is um, bundled together that you use and so on and so forth. And so we left off talking about uh, what about packages that are mainly just containing data. Well, a good example of this would be the New York flights data. If you read through R4DS, the New York flights data is pretty prominent and used throughout that book. Um, this is actually a data set that is available um, for your use, and it is licensed under a, um, let me just double check, is under a, a CCO license or CC0 license, um, which does not have attribution to it. It's available for you to use. Um, but again, it's under that license of that CC0, um, but it's a good example of if you're going to make data open source, you can put a CC0 license onto it and uh, make it available. Obviously, you have to know what the data ownership is, but it's just a good example of if you are going to make data open source, um, you can place it under a CC0 license. Uh, I did have a couple questions about this like CC0 license and data that's freely available because my question, the question that I've had that's come up before, and I don't know if people in the group, maybe I was wondering if anybody in the group had any experience with this, but uh, what makes things considered to be data that's freely available? Um, because a good example that I've come across is there's um, there's a set of packages called like sport the sports dataverse. It's a group of individuals who have been developing a lot of different packages to um, make sports data more accessible. So professional leagues and like um, here in the United States, uh, university leagues and so on and so forth. Um, they've started to kind of develop these packages, but as you kind of dig into some of these packages. Some of this data comes from different sources that necessarily I don't think is necessarily owned by the people who are developing these packages. Now, I've kind of dug in through a couple of these and I saw that some of them are MIT licensed and so on and so forth. So I just I didn't really know if anybody like had any idea of how the licensing works with like something like this. 
like this data is publicly available. Like you could go to ES, ESPN.com and, you know, see that data. You could record that data yourself. I mean, if you wanted to, you could scrape that data if it's with the terms of the service of the website. Um, so I just, I didn't know if anybody had any input on this because this was something I was like, well, how do you license this? Like, how do you license your package that has data that's coming from these like, you know, available sources? So that's a, that's a really uh, interesting thought. So like uh, Major League Baseball, uh, NFL, uh, these commercial businesses are even televised are, are usually closed in some form. You're, you're not going to be able to, to scrape off of it. So it is surprising that they're accessing data sets that could potentially well, one of the one of the bigger uh, issues is obviously uh, sensitivity. Um, so, certain data sets may have some very sensitive media. I'm thinking like medical records, etc. So, by default, they're automatically going to be closed. Um, what I was going to add to the thought was government. I think anything that's posted on the .gov site. Let me double check this, but I'm pretty sure is automatically public use or creative commons um, because it, it, it's government data, right? So the intent would be that it's already been sanitized uh, in posting or that it, does ha it doesn't have any, um, pose any possibility of, of being corrupt, uh, corrupt data. I'm, I'm trying to say that it's either sensitive information or, or has something to do with, with uh, individuals. Now I'm taking the topic into a security slash sensitivity realm, but same concept with the with the Olympics, uh, NFL. Um, well, I'm thinking NBC. Uh, NBC is usually um, broadcasting Olympics. They always talk about it being closed. Uh, NFL and, and uh, M, uh, Major League Baseball. Anybody else have any thoughts there too? This was something that I, I kind of dug into a little bit because I, I, I teach a class in, in sports data analytics. And um, this is one thing that I've always questioned was, is like, this data is available online. There are websites that are available that you could download this data, you know, get this data. But my question was like, you know, like you were saying, Ryan, was just like, how do you license that? I mean, if you're going to have this data and make it open source for people to use, is it considered open source if it's online and you just put a like a package wrapper around it and it's considered open source? Well, so that's right. Yeah, sometimes the curation is where the licensing piece comes in. So how it's curated, uh, the the organization that is uh, recording it or storing it, um, sometimes their business or uh, public entity may be of a closed source nature. And so therefore it comes in with some different licensing. Hmm. That's a good point. I don't know. This was just something that was just, it's, it's always, I've, you know, I've had questions about it before and, you know, I've come across a couple of threads on like Reddit that talk about this, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's, you can't, I don't know. And this is, like I said, I'm not a lawyer. You can't copyright fact, right. And so like, even though that this data is available, you can't, and again, this was a Reddit thread. I don't know if there was any legal people that were behind this, but they were saying it's fact, right? Like you could watch a, a sports game or something like that, record that data yourself if you wanted to, and then, you know, store it however you want. But I mean, most people aren't doing that. They're getting that information from somewhere else. At least I would assume that's the case for most of these, but I don't know. It's just kind of interesting because it's kind of that like, kind of that gray area of like, you know, you're creating a package for data, but how do you license that package if it's not technically your data, but the data is publicly available? So I don't know if anybody has any insight on that. I would love to know. Um, uh, Ryan, you brought up a good point about like government, um, um, government focused data. Um, I know we have some international people here, um, so I'm not, um, or people from um, from other countries, so I'm not totally familiar with um, available sources that other people have, but here in the United States, we have the U.S. Census Bureau, um, but basically someone has created a tidy census package, kind of the same thing, but it just is a wrapper that um, makes API requests, so it's just making API requests to um, the Census Bureau to pull census data. 
And so I was interested in the licensing and how that worked because this person doesn't necessarily own that data. The, the U.S. government owns that data and makes it public. But um, digging into it, it seemed like this was another MIT license, um, which, yeah, it was another MIT license. And so, I don't know, it was just kind of interesting when it, when it was talking about creating or setting up licensings for, or licen licensing for different data sets that are available. So um, you can also do a CC BY license as well. So if you would like this data set that you're going to be making uh, available in open source, you can do a CC BY license again, uh, where that would just require attribution. So uh, what other question? question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go for it. So for the tidy census package, for example. So that's, is that licensing for the package or the data? Of the, like the source code of the package or for the data? The way I understand it, and I've only used this a little bit, is that this licensing would be for the package itself, is the way I would understand it. Because, mm -hmm. because the package, all this does is it's just a wrapper around a bunch of functions that send out API requests to which that the US government, the US Census Bureau makes the API endpoints available. So the software that makes those API requests, I think that's what the licensing covers. It doesn't cover the data, it just covers the API or the functions to make those API requests. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, Aaron? Yeah. You, I, I think with that, tidy census data or tidy census package, I believe you have to create an account with the government to utilize the APIs. I, I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure in most cases when you're using a computing device to access data sets from the government, they usually have to authenticate in some manner. Um, it's, it's preventing spamming and stuff. I, I'll double check that for sure once I uh, load the package real quick. Yeah, again, it was just one of those kind of interesting questions too. Like if you have this kind of package here, how do you license it? I mean, you know, this person doesn't own this data, but they've created a package to work with this data that's making API requests. So um, it's just kind of interesting how that is all related. Um, okay, so uh, so then the, the next thing that we need to talk about is, well, what happens in situations where we receive certain code or we decide to use certain code within our packages? Well, the first thing is, is like the first kind of scenario is, is like code that's given to you. And especially if you're working in open source, you make your code available for other people to use. And it's a useful package that other people are using their own workflows. They're going to want to contribute to it. And so there are, there are times that people will try and submit code to you. If you host on something like GitHub, people are going to do that through pull requests. Um, and so how do you license that code? Um, so what's going to happen is, is there's going to be that contributor license agreement or the CLA. Uh, if you don't have a CLA, the way I understand it, the book was saying is that the copyright is going to go to the author. So the person who gave you the code, unless your contributor licensing agreement says otherwise. And so um, I think, you know, there's those contributor guides uh, if you want to contribute to anything through our studio or you want to contribute to anything through tidyverse i haven't dug through those yet but they have kind of these contributor license ag agreements where it basically says if you contribute to our our library you contribute to this package this code we become the copyright holder and you're giving up your rights to that code and so it's just it's important to understand that if you are going to be contributing one if you're going to be contributing to open source projects just understand that if there is a cla agreement that CLA agreement is going to dictate who is the copyright holder in that situation. If you're somebody who is creating a package that's going to be open source that people are going to be contributing to, it's good to kind of consider, well, maybe you should have a contributor licensing agreement so that people understand that if they make contributions to your code base, they understand who the copyright holder is and what ownership is and how attribution will be handled and so on and so forth. And I think the other thing is when it comes to code that's given to you in regards to licensing is it's good to acknowledge the contribution. Um, it's just good practice to be generous and thankful, um, especially things that are open source. Most, most people that are contributing to open source projects 
are not getting paid for it. They're basically volunteering for it. And so it's always good to say thanks to that. Um, if they've created a significant contribution in some way, you maybe make them, um, you know, uh, you, you add them to the description file, so on and so forth. Again, your contributor licensing agreement, you know, will dictate, you know, how the description file and contributors get added to it. But it's just always good to be thankful because again, in open source, people are doing this for free and it's just good to be thankful um, every time that you do that. So then uh, the next kind of scenario that comes up is code that you wanna bundle. So what kind of scenarios might this happen? Well, it could be that you're creating um, some type of shiny app or web page that you want to use like an HTML widget, or you want to use a different um, cascading style sheet or JS library, and you want to create a function wrapper around that code so that you can use it within your website or your shiny app. Well, if you do that, or you put that in your package or whatever, um, that's a scenario where you're going to have to kind of consider these licensing issues. The other thing is uh, situations where um, you're providing like an R wrapper around a, a C or a C++ um, kind of library. So I know Rex was talking about, uh, I think, what was it, two times ago that you were considering about um, creating like a wrapper around some C functions and stuff. Um, that, that's that situation there that you might bundle that in that you're going to have to take into consideration what are the licensing implications of it. And then the last one is, is if you find out that you don't want to take on those dependencies of using some HTML library or some JavaScript library or some C library, or even some um, other R package or function in R package, what you might want to do is you'll copy a small amount of R code that you're going to put into your package. Now, if you find yourself into these scenarios or these types of scenarios, your first question that you should be is, are the licensing, are the licenses compatible? So the code that you're going to bundle into your package, is that license compatible with the license that you're using with your package? Because if it's not, certain licensing is going to dictate how you can actually use that code. And so if it's a copy left, you're going to have to have a licensing that allows you to do a copy left. And so you need to know those implications. And again, there's just so many different flavors of licensing out there. So you're going to have to read up on it. And especially if you're going out there and you're going to use like a package or a library from a different programming language that's open source, you really want to understand these licensing um, to make sure that it's compatible with each other so that you can actually bundle this code within your package. Um, one important thing is, is that when you're distributing this bundle code, um, you can add additional restrictions, but you can't remove restrictions from it. So if you take somebody's code and you bundle it into your package, you can add additional restrictions to it, but you can't remove restrictions from that code because again, that license gets carried over from that bundle code. Um, there is an interesting discussion and, and I wanted to hear other people's viewpoint on this, but uh, Stack Overflow code. Um, Maybe I won't ask how many people have copied and pasted code from Stack Overflow onto into your own work, which uh, I'll reserve that question for other people, but I'm sure people have done it. Um, so uh, what do you think? Do you think that's, do you think it's a good practice? Do you think it's a bad practice? Um, what's your interpretation of it? It's a bad practice for me because I never understand what I'm copying and pasting, but um, that doesn't completely answer your question. <laughs> My question was a little murky. Everybody's done it. I mean, there's been time, I mean, when you're on a deadline, you know, you, you go out and you try and find the solution. Um, uh, anybody else, what other interpretations do people have about it? I was gonna add a comment that uh, I don't know if the world of IT would move forward uh, if we weren't able to, or if people didn't copy and paste code or share code, um, that's my two cents. I am very bad about it. Um, good statement about, um, I don't quite understand everything that I always paste, but if the code works, I usually, uh, leave it as is. Any other viewpoints? Not really from a licensing standpoint, but I just watched, um, a video about, programming and security 
and how like you, like the presenter was like, surely people won't just copy code from the internet and run it. <laughs> and it's absolutely what a lot of people do. So just from a security um, standpoint, it's it's not advisable, I suppose. <laughs> Any other interpretations? I think these are all, I think this is all great feedback. Um, you know, before I had the, before I was reading into this licensing stuff and kind of dug more into chapter nine, I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, I find a solution to it. You know, I just throw it in my script and I'm good to go. But as I've kind of read this and kind of thinking about like creating a package that's going to be potentially open source someday, there is licensing implications to that. And so um, if you dig into it, Stack Overflow, the code that's on there, according to their terms of agreement, are CC by SA license. And so if you look at this technically, if you're going to put a GPL v3 onto your, onto your package and you're pulling in Stack Overflow content into it and you're using that code, the licensing aren't compatible technically. And so you have licensing implications. Now, um, it's just something to take, take into consider with licensing. Now, people also brought up some other good points. Security concerns, uh, you know, bad practices. Um, it's usually generally a good idea to know what your code is doing and how it's running. And so, yes, you know, we all get under that pressure of being under a deadline and we have to get it done and we have to figure out the solution then. But it's also important to understand what the code is doing. So, I think Stack Overflow is a good thing to use. I think most people are going to use it, but just understand that if you are going to bundle this type of code into your package, you need to understand that there might be licensing, um, there might be some licensing compatibility issues, and you need to take that into consideration. Uh, there, there is this graphic that I found that was linked in the book, and I just decided to put it in here. Um, but I'm not going to dig into this. But th I thought this was kind of a good idea to kind of see the different um, compatibility that certain um, licensing have or licenses have with other licenses. And so it's kind of neat to kind of see um, just how kind of things are interconnected. And it's really kind of a good reminder to remember, okay, how does this license relate to this? And is it compatible with, compatible with this one? And if it's not, then, you know, what are the implications of that? So if you are going to include bundle code, make sure you preserve all the existing license and copyright statements so that you can make it easy and possible for future readers to understand what the licensing situation is. Say you have a project that you're contributing to, uh, you know, that you've been working on for a while and you pass on to somebody else. Protect them by giving them the licensing information, because if they're gonna carry that project forward, they need to understand what the current situation is surrounding the licensing of that specific package or that open source project. Uh, so this is just another good reason to use Git because it allows you to make sure that you see what code is being used and how it's changed over time. And so you could track down what bits of code have been bundled in and so on and so forth. Um, also make sure that you, you know, include that kind of standard metadata within your author, portion of it. So if you are going to bundle code from somebody else, make sure that you provide that kind of metadata into your description file so that people kind of know what that is. And then um, if you do run into a compatibility issue with the licensing with your bundled code, you can add this file called license.note that will describe, that will allow you to put notes in there to describe what the incompatibility issues are. And so, um, people who are going to take on the project will know in the future what those licensing compatibility issues are. And so it's just documented and you can keep moving forward. So, so that's licensing. What did I miss? What questions do people have? Uh, comments? Sorry, I realized I do have a question that may or may not be related to licensing. I mean, I guess it is. So I'm actually writing a package, but it's taking someone else's code that's in an academic article, but this article isn't published yet. It's a preprint. So I feel like there's just a lot of layers to sort through there. Um, it's on the, I can't remember what the name of this specific archive is, but um, yeah, it's just in the supplemental or supplementary materials. And so um, I think they're gonna be authors on the package, but I guess what I'm wondering is um, one, if there are any 
licensing issues taken from that preprint server. And then also if there's just like a general references section to, you know, in our packages to cite, say the article where you took it from. So I think uh, at least the preprint servers that I'm most, most familiar with by archive has so the authors retain the copyright and they choose a license at the time of publishing their article. So I think it would depend on the license that they have chosen. Like see, so one of the creative commons, like CCBY or CCBY NC or whatever. Perhaps, I don't know. Anybody else have any insight for Brendan? I always thought unless the article is published and it gives reference to the, the university or, or academic, academic um, institution, um, it's, it's the publisher I thought that, that creates that. Um, in academia, I thought if you're published in the, in the uh, world of academics, it becomes the institution's property. But I, I, I'm very, very, very not uh, comfortable in in sticking behind those comments i don't i don't know i'm adding to the conversation and maybe that well maybe that maybe that has to do with research funding like uh isabella i think last week you had brought up the uh, statement of of grant money and then doing some kind of study related to that the grant owner is the is the license holder do you recall that, that comment? Yeah, um, at least in my experience, if it's data like created or collected under contract, then it's the, the funder who owns it. And then for grants, it's a lot more flexible in terms of like what the goals of the grants are and, and you know the particular like stipulations from the grant proposal process. Um, but we didn't really work with preprints, and so that I'm, I'm not sure. It, this is this whole topic that we're having today is very part and partial to a, a conversation that's happening on Slack right now. There was a statement or a request from one of the, the cohort members related to some of the images in our publications that we have in our book clubs, and the, the reference was what kind of license do we add to it? So both John and Tan have jumped in and we're adding their own thoughts to it um, at the end of the, the entire thread. Uh, John just jumped in and said, don't worry about it. That's, that's me that has to worry about that, um, taking responsibility as the learning community facilitator. So um, if there should be any legalities by us as cohort book members uh, using data from our, our books, uh, if anybody were to come back at us, uh, that would be, John probably taking action on it. That doesn't answer Brennan's question, so I apologize. <clears throat> yeah, that's a that's a very interest that's a very interesting question. I'm I'm not sure. Um, so you have access to the package that you're using in your own research. Yeah, so it's just a bunch of sort of messy code that he created or he wrote to accomplish. Um, something. And so I'm going to put it into a package or I've already put it into one. Hmm. I think it will, you know, I mean, it kind of goes back and I don't know, I can't, it, I don't know like the organizational structure of it, but it, I go back to what the book said, you know, once it's, it's, once it's written down, the person who wrote it, they're the copyright holder. And so they get to decide the licensing of it, but I'm not sure of how that works with the, um, but then the other question too is, is there code being bundled from that? Did that person pull code that was bundled from other packages? Because that may dictate your licensing as well too. So if they use like dplyr, you know, that may, you might be already, your, your decision might already be made. So. Right. No, I think, I think it's all base R. Um, so I guess I don't have to worry about that aspect, but um, yeah, anyways, this is giving me good food for thought. So thank you everyone. Well, I think base would under be under GPL, wouldn't it? I don't know. Somebody could correct me. If, I think it's GPL too, because base is a package. It's just a 
it's just a standard package that's brought in with R. So I, I would guess that's a copy left, but somebody correct me if I'm wrong. So you might have to be GPL two or three to match up with that version if you're going to use base R, but hands up. <laughs> consult consult with the developer and, and see what they say and say, hey, I had this conversation about licensing. I'm throwing this into a package. Um, we probably should choose a license just to be safe. So um, cool. Any other questions, any other comments that people have? All right, great. So um, we're going to jump over to uh, chapter 10. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about object documentation. Uh, so here are the learning objectives for this chapter. Uh, really what I want to get out of this is I want to be able to describe the benefits of well-developed object documentation. So really understand why we should care about this topic. Then I'm going to focus on discussing the definition of object documentation. So really defining what it is and what it is not. Uh, identify some of the key components that we need to have when we create object documentation for different R objects. So that includes object documentation for functions, the packages are the package itself, and things like generics, classes, and methods. So your S3s, your S4s, and your RCs. Um, also, I want to focus on kind of demonstrating the object documentation workflow. And then the last thing is discuss some general formatting and style guidelines that you want to keep in mind as you create your um, object documentation. We already did the warm up and icebreaker. So um, the first thing is to kind of talk about is why should we care about this? Why should we care about our object documentation? Um, you know, many of us kind of think, oh, maybe we should just be writing the code. We should just be focusing on the code to get it to work. Well, we also need to take into consideration that object documentation is super, super important when we're developing our package. The reason this is, is because uh, how are other people going to know how to use your package? So um, you decide to write a bunch of functions that you want to make available to other people. And you say, here you go. Here are my functions. Use them. And people look through them and they can't read them. And maybe you're a uh, uh, you're kind of a tidyverse person and another person's a base R person and they sit there and say, I have no idea how to use this. Well, one way to communicate the use of your function is to actually write your object documentation. The other important thing about this is inform your future self. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure many of you have had that experience before where you've worked on a project six, eight months ago and someone says, hey, why don't you do this, do this analysis again? And you go back to that analysis and you say, wow, this is a dumpster fire. I don't know what I did with this. So object documentation helps you kind of re-download what you did before into your mindset to be like, oh, this is how I, this was the problem. This is how I approached it. And this is how I use the different objects within my package to solve those problems. And then the other thing is, is informing other contributors. So if you are going to make this, um, if you're going to make your package open source and you want other people to contribute to it, one of those barriers to contribution is figuring out how to actually use your package so that people can contribute to it. Um, I'm sure many of you have kind of had that experience where you'd like to contribute to a project and you open up the package code and you sit there and say, I have no idea how to use this. And that is just a barrier. If you don't know how to use it, you're not going to want to contribute to it. And so um, it's just good that to have this object documentation because it allows for you to inform other contributors how to actually use the package and how to potentially contribute to it. So that's kind of why we should care about it. Um, let's kind of put a little definition behind it. So um, the main thing to really kind of know tonight, and obviously it's gonna move on into next week as well, is, is that our focus is gonna be on object documentation. And there's a difference between object documentation versus longer form documentation, which is known as vignettes. So, um, I'm going to skip this question, but uh, I thought this was kind of an interesting uh, kind of thought to kind of think about is, is that we're documenting objects in our R package. And so um, I've kind of changed my mindset on this a little bit because I've been introduced into object oriented programming and it's kind of changed my mindset of how like things are structured, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of interesting to think about what objects are we actually documenting within a package? Um, 
many of us are going to kind of go towards, well, we're documenting our functions. Well, functions are just one piece that gets added to a package. Our package might contain certain things like um, different uh, class objects. It may contain different generics. It may be the package itself. We may be including certain types of data within our package that, we're, that we want our users to use. And so all of those are different objects that we can um, add specific documentation to. Uh, many of us have had the experience of accessing the help files with the question mark or the help function. Uh, so my question for you on this one is, um, how many of you are question mark people for your help documentation? Raise your hand. I am, I'm a question mark. Is anybody a help function person? No. Does anybody do the point and click, go over to like the help tab and then kind of dig in? I'm having no nightmares. I'm, I'm having nightmares of F1 on Windows, uh, the, the paper clip or the, the little guy that jumps out uh, at you and scares you, uh, giving you tips. I'm joking. <laughs> so I think this is probably the most common, right? Question mark the way, oh, question, yeah, question, question mark, pivot longer every day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or when you're in like package development and you don't necessarily know if you've got your function working, you do question mark, question mark. So um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, so I think both the most popular is going to be that question mark, so I don't need to dig into that too, too much. Um, so object documentation, what is it? Well, the book talks about it. It's reference documentation. So what is its purpose? Its purpose is to serve as a reference. And so I thought the book had a really good kind of um, analogy for this is it's, it's like a dictionary entry, right? It kind of gives you the definition of what your object does in your package. Um, it also brought this up as a very important point with object documentation, especially when it used kind of this, this example of, of it being like a dictionary entry, is that if you don't know what the package does or you don't necessarily know what functions are available, object documentation might not be the tool that you use to inform your users on how to like actually use your package. And that's where vignettes come in. So really it's kind of good to have that mindset that this is kind of like a dictionary entry. Uh, a good, this is a great example, um, especially thinking about it being kind of this uh, as a reference is when you're thinking about your object names, think about using some kind of standardized naming conventions. Uh, I think the best one that's out there is string R. Uh, I mean, many of you are probably familiar with string R, but I love the naming conventions for string R because, and I'm gonna bring over my example here. So if you're not familiar with string R, um, they have this naming convention where they use this prefix str. Um, it's great for, uh, it's great just in case you ever forget what types of functions that are available. And so when you think about it, it's great uh, to kind of, consider what you're naming, because if you have this kind of prefix, you can quickly go through and kind of see what things are named and see what functions are available. So it's just good to kind of think about when you're thinking about your object documentation, it starts at how you actually name your actual object that you're trying to document. So uh, the big thing that I talked about before is just know that there's a difference between different types of documentation. Uh, there's that difference between the object itself, which we're gonna talk about in vignettes, Object documentation is going to be more short form, kind of reference guide. And then those vignettes is going to be kind of that long form documentation. And the focus is going to be different for vignettes. So vignettes are going to be more focused on how do we use the objects in our package to solve a specific problem or to solve the problems that our package is trying to solve. And so we'll talk more about that as we get to chapter 11. So let me go into this next one here. So um, let's talk a little bit about an overview of object documentation and some of the kind of concepts surrounding it. Uh, I shamelessly took this from the uh, previous cohort, this diagram here. I think this was one thing that just made it all click for me when I saw it. Um, so when you think about this, when we're actually developing our package, we're writing our, our objects. And in this case here, I'm just developing a function. And that was what we talked about in chapter seven was how do we create functions? As we write that, kind of the kind of the, the workhorse behind everything is going to be this R oxygen two. 
So um, pretty much within package development, especially according to this book, we're going to develop all of our object documentation using this package called our oxygen 2. Now with this package here, what it's going to do is it's going to take our dot R files and it's going to convert them into dot RD files in the man folder. And that's what we get into chapter 10. Another important thing that our oxygen 2 manages for us is it's also gonna set up our namespace, which we're not gonna talk about until we get to chapter 13, but it really kind of shows within this diagram that these kind of object documentation, it goes beyond, or its importance goes beyond just the actual kind of like documentation that you're writing. It's also important because it also manages how your objects are managed within the namespace of your package. So it's just kind of interesting to know that all these things are kind of interrelated to each other. So um, first thing to know is that documentation files are rendered from a syntax loosely based on LaTeX. Do they say that right? I know there's different ways people say it. I say LaTeX. Does somebody pronounce it differently? I've heard LaTeX. I don't know, does anybody like have a strong conviction to the way, the way it's pronounced? I know some people do, but anyways. Um, it's kind of based on, it's loosely based on um, a, a syntax called LaTeX. Uh, and then what this kind of syntax does is it will convert, uh, it's used to convert these .rd files into different formats, such as HTML, plain text, or PDF. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of um, syntax, it's, uh, it's more described in the R extensions manual. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it because these are the files that you're not going to be working with. You're not going to be hand changing these. And so if you are interested in seeing what they look like, and just as a quick example, I'm going to pop it up. I'm going to go back to our regex excite. Um, you'll see that with our object documentation, it's going to be put into the man folder here. And then these are our .rd files. Now these .rd files, these files are not um, these are not, these are read only. You're not going to change these by hand. And so these files are generated from your .r files. And specifically, they're generated from this Roxygen or this R Oxygen 2 skeleton right here, which we'll talk about the each individual components here in a little bit. But basically, these files uh, are converted into the .rd files. And then those RD files are converted into um, an HTML, PDF, plain text, whatever it needs to be. So I, I mentioned that we're not going to be kind of changing those files by hand. So what are we going to use to actually do that? We're going to use our Oxygen 2. Uh, it provides kind of a more user-friendly syntax to create this documentation. Uh, how does it do that? It's going to use um, comments uh, using these kind of at tags. It's going to convert them to those man RD files, and then it's going to convert them to HTML or PDF. What's great about this, about using our Oxygen 2 for our object documentation, is it helps us intermingle our code with our documentation. So there's no separate file. So as you're writing your, your object, or you're writing your object definition, whether that be a function, class, generic, so on and so forth, your Oxygen skeleton is going to be on top. I keep saying Roxygen, our Oxygen, excuse me. Your R oxygen skeleton is going to be on top. So it's just kind of a good reminder to say, okay, as I make changes to my object, I'm going to modify the documentation to make sure it reflects how that object is actually supposed to work. Uh, the other thing that's nice about this is it abstracts away the differences for documenting different objects. So uh, we'll talk about the different objects that you can document using this. What's nice about using this R Oxygen 2 package is that it's smart enough to know what, what type of object you're using. So if you're writing a function, what's nice about it is you can use the key binding uh, shift command or shift control alt R and it will create that kind of boilerplate for you. And so what's nice about that is, is that if you have certain parameters, you have certain arguments within it, it will already build that kind of skeleton for you so you don't have to do that yourself. And then the other important thing, which we'll get into more into chapter 13, is it's going to manage our namespace file, which is important because it's going to make those objects available for our users to use 
when they install and load and use our package. Okay. So uh, what questions do people have about kind of this like brief overview about our documentation or the definition or why we should care about documentation? I always document or take notes mainly for future proofing myself. Uh, it's very common that I'll go back to something years and years ago and look at it and think, what was I thinking at that time? And that's a common practice of, of most uh, individuals that are um, actively working on writing code. It doesn't often come uh, right off the, uh, it's like any other language. It doesn't immediately, um, uh, you're a rarity if you can just sit down and start writing code uh, right out of the gate. Uh, most people have to stare at what exactly they're trying to do, run it, try it, etc. So documenting that is future proofing, going back to it at a later point. Um, you can always optimize things, but that first initial uh, writing of it, uh, try to try to capture exactly what you were thinking at that time. And maybe I, I, I don't think I'm the unique one by having that state. No, I, I, I agree with you. So what do they call it? Um, documentation focused development. Is that what they call it? Like when you're like the way I see it, we can mention Ryan, like going back to the importance of it. And again, like I've only done this for so many years. I'm not a professional software developer is, is that you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're going to have like a com some complex steps that you're going to need to solve. And so it's like, you need to kind of do a little bit of pseudo coding. And so you need to kind of figure out like, what are the steps that my function needs to take to actually solve this? And if you can document that first, it gives you a really good kind of roadmap of how to actually solve it. And in addition to that, it's going to help you kind of take a step back and get that 50,000 foot view to potentially optimize it later. And so I never really, because before, like you said, it was always like for me when I was developing was like this idea of like, I'm just going to write functions. I'm just going to write code. That's all I'm going to do because that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. Well, and the, the same can be said about UML uh, authoring. So I, I always, while sitting in class, listening to the professor and talking about uh, coding computer science type stuff, and they always just stressed, stressed about this UML documentation. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Like, like it makes sense. It, it kind of looks like a flow diagram esque, right? You're giving all your classes and you know what variables you want, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it, it gives you the skeleton of actually writing your object oriented programming. But if anybody has ever been in the situation of brainstorming or trying to sketch out what you want a particular function or program to do, um, it actually is more complicated. And again, going back to my statement of that argument, uh, I argue with myself. So when I'm writing something, it's usually those baby steps of formulating. And I would recommend to any user, um, while you're doing that, pick whatever form best fits your needs. Don't try to follow a, you know, I don't know, recommended form of doing something. Yes, that's the more formal way of doing it, but um, start whatever makes you feel confident because if you don't, you'll only get more and more frustrated with it. I don't know if that helps anybody. It's just an advice thing that I've tried to follow myself. I think it saves time too, because if you can, if you can solve the problem, because a lot of, a lot of the things that slow you down is like, the syntax and the developing of it, right? Searching for functions and stuff. But if you just can kind of get the general idea down in your documentation of it, it's going to make things go faster because it's, fo it's making you focus. And then the other thing too, you get an added benefit is if you document it before you have that later, right? And so it's not like that documentation goes to waste. It's, it's available for you later as well. So... I was going to throw one more humorous comment. So in LaTeX is is how I normally pr pronounce it, right, wrong, or indifferent. But you have to write a thousand lines of text or a thousand lines of code just to print two lines on a document. That's a that's a joke. But the second point, um, all of these different translation medias are awesome. These utilities are awesome until you have to debug or figure out why they're breaking. That always seems to be another difficulty that I run into, uh, lending back to my statement of the frustration piece. 
um, do whatever makes you confident, and then um, you'll get better at uh, uh, progression later in, in your career. Excellent, excellent. Um, so uh, the next kind of part about it is like the documentation workflow. So, um, you know, as you create your object, as you're deciding to create your um, object documentation, the book kind of talks about two different types of workflows that you can follow. Um, I tried to create kind of a flow chart of this. I don't know if this is useful or not, but I decided to do it because I didn't want any more just like straight text. So just to kind of make it a little bit more interesting. Um, there's two different types of workflows that are available to you um, when you want to actually go and test or when you actually want to create your object documentation and you want to test it. Uh, the first one is very fast, but just know that if you have certain links throughout your documentation, those links are not going to work. The second one is more slow, um, but the links are going to work if you do that. And basically what you're going to do is the two different ways that you can do this is either through the DevTools document, which has the key binding control command shift D, or that kind of build and reload control command shift B. And really it kind of starts off with just the basic decision of, do you want to test your links? Yes or no. If you want to test your links to make sure that you see how things are linked, then you're going to have to do that kind of slower build and reload, preview your documentation. Does it look good or does it not? If it does, move on with your development. If it doesn't, go back, make your modification. If you don't care about testing out your links, you can go kind of that fast route and then you can just do the dev tools document or that key binding control command shift D um, preview your documentation, go back up to make sure it looks good, and then make that decision if you need to make further modifications, so on and so forth. So uh, the best way to think of it, uh, the book talks about it as the uh, rinse and repeat. You're constantly just doing a lot of iteration, right? You're just making changes, checking it, you know, uh, building it, checking it, and then making changes or moving forward with your development. And so it's just kind of that constant over and over and over again. So if I have one bit of advice for this, um, just learn that control command shift D, those key bindings, because it will make your life so much easier because you will do it over and over and over and over and over again. So uh, let's see what happens rendering behind the scenes. Uh, basically, we talked about this before. Here's just some more diagrams of it. We're gonna start from source where we're gonna create that R oxygen two skeleton. Uh, we're going to have our object here. We're going to do that dev tools document, build and reload. It's going to convert it into that man file or not the man file. It's going to put it into that man directory as a .rd file, which looks like this. And then it's going to get our final output, which will be HTML or PDF. Again, this is what the user will see if they do the question mark, your object name, or if they access your documentation, if it's hosted on CRAN, you can get the PDF manual because I think those PDF manuals on CRAN are developed from the .rd files, correct? Somebody correct me if I'm right or wrong. I believe it's a Pandoc rendering of, or late, maybe LaTeX rendering to produce PDF, yes. I think this will be the last thing I cover here because I think I can get through the rest of these um, and we can start vignettes next week. Uh, after I forget through this. So um, really the nuts and bolts of it, uh, you've kind of seen these before. Um, if you've developed um, our oxygen two ske our skeletons before, there's four basic building blocks to this. You're going to have your comment lines. Um, you're going to use the pound sign with a, a single quotation. Um, that's just going to start your comment block. Then as you build multiple lines, that's going to constitute a block. If you create your block, remember, um, as you put kind of text within your blocks, make sure that you wrap it at 80 characters. Um, if you want to know where you're at 80 characters wise, um, you can use this kind of um, key binding here to highlight the R oxygen 2 skeleton and then just reflow it to 80 characters. There is also um, a setting in RStudio that you can set that will create or put an 80 character line on for you. So I have that set right here. Um, here's that 80 character line. So if you want to, I can show this afterwards if people are interested in this, but you can set this in your settings to get this 80 character line if you want. <clears throat> um, 
within these uh, our oxygen two comments, you're going to have tags. Tags break up the blocks, so this kind of creates sections within your documentation. And then kind of the really kind of important piece of these building blocks is the introduction portion of the skeleton. So the first sentence in this R oxygen two um, block is going to be the title. So um, when it renders, the first sentence is going to be your title. There is some specific style guide stuff that you can read more about it um, in the book. I'm not going to kind of dig into that, but you can kind of see some of the style guide stuff surrounding that. The second paragraph that you have after your first sentence is going to be your description. Uh, in your description, you're going to discuss what does the function actually do. And then any paragraphs that are three and above are going to provide more detail. Um, I have to, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember and I can look it up, but I think this will come after your arguments. So any paragraphs that are three and above are going to provide additional information after your function arguments. Uh, all objects, when you do do object documentation, must have a title and description. That's the base that you need. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the tag um, at export. Um, but really, if you're going to create a, a, an object within your package, you really just need a, a title and description, and that's it. You don't need to provide details. But again, just if you want people to use it, you want to be nice to your future self, or you want other people to contribute, it's a good thing to provide additional details so people know what the object does and why it's useful. And then and, and the big thing of, of these building blocks here and these tags is that these blocks and tags are, are used to give our documentation structure. And so basically you're creating a document for people to read. And so um, these kind of blocks and tags give us that kind of structure for our users to actually see, use when they do the question mark, whatever your object name is for the object that they want to get more information on. So I'm already three minutes over. Um, so I'll open it up for any questions or comments that people may have um, at this time. So questions, comments. Great. Uh, so I think, I think I'll be able to get through this in about uh, 20 minutes, Ryan. Do you think you'll be able to at least start the conversation of vignettes next week? 100%. Yeah, without question. Okay. And, and if, if you go long, that's okay too. Yeah, I'm trying not to dominate the conversation because I don't want to be droning on for people, but licensing took us a little bit longer than I thought. And, and so I think I can blaze through object documentation. Um, because we often just all we have left is talking about how we document specific things um and then just some like minor details that we need to know about so um, i was i was going to comment on the uh yet another syntax or another semantic and and coding um it, it, i haven't done package development yet so i apologize i haven't used our oxygen uh to date but i it was just in the back of my mind of oh i've got another thought to keep in mind uh keyboard shortcuts, et cetera, to uh, study on. Somebody confirm or deny for me. It's R oxygen two, right? I feel like I, I used to oh. oxygen before too. I think Roxygen is a cooler name because it's got like <laughs> rocks in it. But that's just me. I don't want to mispronounce it because I've heard people call it R oxygen two. But I, I really like just that rocks because it's like this documentation rocks. I don't know. <laughs> I always think it's uh, it, uh, oxygen. Oxygen is an, is an XML uh, authoring tool. So I didn't know for me the connection between R and then oxygen combined. I'm like, is this like XML? What are we doing here? I don't think there's any reference or any relation uh, in that respect. Somebody should dig into that because I'm I'm interested. I, I'm interested now because like when you first look at it, you think rocks is what it is, but I've heard people call it our oxygen too. But I'm in a quest that any any 
package that has mm -hmm. R somewhere connected in it, I always try to uh, give emphasis to the R, um, D ply R, uh, not broom, I guess, but um, yeah, Roxygen. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the Roxygen comment. But then if it's R Oxygen, where's the oxygen come in? Like, I know what you said with the authoring tool, because that could be it. But where's the oxygen come in? Is it just because it, it's at the top? Because, you know, oxygen floats to the top? I, I don't know. It, the, the, the story is, is compelling me to do more research here, but <clears throat> I don't know. Um, the other thing is, 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 is there, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to, didn't mean to jump in. I was going to say, um, I was just looking at the, on the CRAN site for oxygen too, and it says it's inspired by the deoxygen system for C++, which I'd never heard of either, but I guess that's where it's got its name. Is it, is it deoxygen or is it doxygen? Because document and docs, <laughs> I I don't know. I yeah, I'm yeah. just I, <laughs> you know because if you're creating, that. <laughs> I, I I could see mm. the connection, but if, if it is docs because it's documents, then it would be I don't know. Somebody somebody needs to create like a recording of it and like put it on the site so people know. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll put a maybe I'll put an issue in on Roxygen and be like. Create an audio link so we know how to say our oxygen. Well, the other thing too is if you do mispronounce a word and somebody keys in on it, it just adds your to your credibility. So uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, um, those are uh, terms of endearment. If you start to pronounce things in odd terms, and uh, if you just continue with it, everyone else will follow with you. So you're blazing your own path. It's just hard because these are recorded and they're put on YouTube for all of prosperity to, prosperity to see. So <clears throat> I'll just admit my ignorance up front so nobody yeah, can hold good. it against me. No worries. Um, cool. Uh, what other questions do people have? Uh, I do have, I guess I do have a question when we get to classes. Uh, is anybody like really good with S3, S4 and RC? I've used S3, but not S4 or RC. Like I think, um, I think Frank, Frank Carroll has been has credited. Uh, say if you if you like programming more than you like getting things done, use S four. Otherwise, use S three. I'm like I I kind of understand. I don't know. I was just asking if anybody in the group is more familiar with these because I tripped over this. And so like next week when I talk about it, if somebody wants to jump in and like correct me, like please do because when I first read this, I was like I've never used these objects before, and I know they're they're object oriented concepts or to are there conventions to put object orienting. No, to allow you to do object-oriented oriented programming in R, but I've just never used them. So, anybody else familiar with them? I was anybody posting oh. uh, chapter thirteen. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll read up on chapter thirteen to to look intelligent um, in the advanced R book. We haven't got chapter thirteen yet, so uh, I'll, I'll be future reading, but try to hopefully prepare. Uh, Rex, I really like that comment. That actually makes a lot of sense between the two. I, I tried to read the advanced R sections of it, but it was just like beyond, at least for my knowledge, that I was, at least for the time that I had, I was like, I can't. I think I got RC down because I had some understanding of it. I created a function, I created a, an RC class in regex excite but i don't know if i'm doing it right or not so um but we can talk more about it next week because we're really only talking about object documentation we're not talking about how to use it but you kind of have to kind of know because some of the tags that you use within it kind of go with it so i guess i'm basically opening it up to other people if you if you want to help me out please because i might be i might be drowning and so um so if I flounder a little bit, just somebody jump in and save me. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Cool. Any other questions, comments uh, from anybody else in the group? All right. With that, uh, I, you know, I can I can hang out for a couple more minutes here. Um, but other than that, uh, that's 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 all we're going to cover for this evening. We'll finish up chapter ten, start our discussion of vignettes next week, and so Ryan will be speaking. Again, uh, double check the schedule and see if you're interested in any future topics that are coming up. If you are, just you know, sign up in there, and then we'll go from there. So appreciate everybody, and have a good rest of your night. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Well, and I was going to uh, make a comment about the uh, uh, classes, the various uh, memory storage classes. Um, there is a video, I will find the link, but it is uh, a, uh, no, it's actually a news article, sorry, or, or a fake news. Um, uh, what's that called when you're writing something that's completely fictitious? Um, the author of C, the C language, uh, is either C or C++, but the, the statement was that they authored the programming language so that it would uh, force developers to break machines because you had to invest more money and it was just like a money-making scheme. Um, I'll find it. I think it's completely um, fictitious or, or just humorous uh, satire uh, about the subject. Why I'm making this kind of a humorous comment, I find a lot of the intricate underwebbing services of our studio in a similar manner. Like, mm. Who actually figures this stuff out? I, I, uh, uh, you know, the management of memory and, and functions and like, you know, under 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 webbing under the hood sort of concepts. Node.js is the same way. I, I still have yet to figure out how to wrap all of that together. Um, Ryan S, uh, the other Ryan, was uh, we're in the JavaScript class I think together. Yeah, how's he, had, he doing? Well, he's doing well. Um, I, I think he was extremely inundated. Uh, in his job role, I think the supply chain logistics, et cetera, oh, yeah. business just took off into infinity. But uh, he he did take some downtime. Um, he is in the JavaScript that Russ is uh, facilitating. And I want to say he was in one other. Uh, he was in the ggplot for a while, but that whole, I'm really not sure the status of that book club. Point being, uh, he had posted a, question into the uh, Mastering Shiny thread. Um, well, myself and, and uh, uh, Lucy are, are doing the uh, third cohort of M Shiny. It was related to data sets and storage of data sets and how to actually put them into your R code or like what's the best way of managing this information. And so I was trying to express to him, it's not so much about supplying the data. Uh, it's more of put the data in a location that is optimized for memory usage or, or you don't want the server to incur the cost of processing. You put that back on the user by having an API call that goes and grabs the data set or whatever the case is, um, the browser itself uh, uh, within the, the language process it. I'm not sure I'm answering his question to its fullest extent, but I'm hoping to convey that there's more than just a CSV file, XML file, or, or Excel file of data. Um, you have API calls, there's servers that are giving JSON data, you know, direct database OMDB type calls that are happening too. Anyway. Yeah, that's that's a hard concept to leak. Well, I, I no, not, no disregard to Ryan. When he's asking or posing these questions, I get a, a tendency to interpret them as I only know one way of doing it and I have an unfamiliar way of all other existence. So I run into a similar conflict. There's a uh, engineer that I work with um, that he has a tendency to always go back into this two-dimensional Excel spreadsheet mindset. And I'm like, that's not scalable. <laughs> like you can't do that. It works, but it doesn't, it's not gonna work for, for a, uh, a large, a large uh, application. So I'm trying to introduce him into these other worlds of outside of Windows uh, or any Microsoft-based application. And for him, um, I usually hit this brick wall of comprehension. Uh, I just don't get it. All I know of is Windows. And so offering other opportunity. Well, I think it's one of those things, like, until you see it. Yep. Like, it's one of those things, like, 
yeah because i was i was you know and thinking about like you know when it was with shiny was this idea of like well why can't you do your data wrangling in shiny right like you should be able to right like my right. computer's fast enough to process it it should be fine but then but when you actually like see like what's happening in the browser and Correct. when you see like other people trying to access it or, or you just see like how slow it is then you're just yes. like yeah you have to change this you have the, to offload it to a different service to do yep. it and so or or even like you know the github and and or cdm uh cdn cdn content delivery system that's another topic related to this javascript uh framework where in your html page I'm just pointing in another server that's going to provide me that information, compiling it into the doc, document object model. Again, I know I'm I'm being a little bit too future talking in, in reference to what his questions are, but um, there is a reason, there is a purpose behind why the web works the way it does and mm -hmm. comprehending, understanding these more intricate or elegant ways of linking information together. I don't know. I, do you remember... Um, really poor reference really really poor reference there's a scene in the lord of the rings where frodo is running through the tunnel with the spider i think it's in the mm -hmm. third movie um the books are much better than the movies but um as he's running through there uh he's got all these spider webs connected to him and i always think of like your shiny app in the browser with all of these threads coming from different services that plug in to make the website what it is Maybe not just mastering shiny, but or sorry, just shiny, but just any web page in general, web server in general. But. Well, I guess the thing that you could tell maybe like to help Ryan understand it is like because he comes from I think he comes from it, comes from it from like a, a sequel, because I know he works with SQL and stuff like that. Be like, mm -hmm. well, you know, what you're doing is, you know, why don't you just have like a stored procedure on your SQL database and right. have your shiny app just call that sql server to pull it or the other idea would be like you know i you know i, I think like he would understand the something. concept of yeah well he would understand the concept of a view right like mm -hmm. why do you create a view in in your sql instance or in your like database is because you want to access that date that data quickly you don't want to have to run a, a 20 20 you know a 20 minute you know sql query because nobody's going to sit there and wait for that right so it's like this idea of like why do you do that? It's because it's going to optimize it. And so you can do certain things in shiny to offload that processing in certain ways. And so it's not good to like do like all that processing in the shiny app. And so, I don't know, maybe that, maybe if you kind of put it in the domain that he works in, maybe he'll, you know, grasp earlier, it. earlier today in the advanced R, I did chapter two and we were discussing memory allocation, but it, it didn't get into the, to the references of S3, S4 just yet. It had to do with copy, modify, copy to modify, and then copy in place, I think are the two um, scenarios. Where I was going with the comment was that in today's world with computing power, these options really aren't, it's, it's kind of a, a, a mute point anymore. You don't have to worry about it. Um, garbage collectors and that kind of re, uh, uh, services. However, if you're working with large data sets, it is going to come into play. And even if you buy, or even if you invest in this supercomputer, super server, you know, multi-parallel, whatever operation, it's only going to give you a very small increment of increased speed. Um, you should not saying you should be able to, you know, crunch the gal galactic, you know, uh, uh, mapping on your MacBook. Um, you may need a large computer to, to process those type of uh, uh, applications. But the point being, um, it, it's scalable. It, it's, it's being able to, to adapt to scale. So. Yeah, no, that's the whole thing is like, it's great on your computer by yourself, but once it grows, that's yeah. where the issue is. And, and I kind of came to that same thing with like object oriented programming is mm -hmm. like, you know, as things get more complex, as they grow, you have to add more tools to, you know, you either have to simplify it or you have to add more tools to help you manage that complexity. And there's different tools you can pull in to do that, whether that be different methods, different organization, right. you know, so, so it's like everything works great in like a little area, but the second that you start scaling up the complexity or making it bigger, that's where the challenge comes in. But good point. It, I don't know. I'll anyway, go. well, yeah, I got to go. Have a good rest of your night. And we'll Thank see you, you sir. next week. You as well. Talk right, to talk you soon. Talk to you later. All right, bye-bye.